Hi there. I'm Dr. Michael Martin of the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Jeren de Wolf. De Wolf holds the Queen Beatrix Professorship in Dutch Studies at the University of California, where he is also a professor of German and is director of the Institute for European Studies. His research focuses on both Dutch and Portuguese post-colonial literature and history, as well as the transatlantic slave trade. Professor DeWolf publishes in five different language, languages, English, Dutch, German, Portuguese, and French. For his scholarly service, he has been distinguished by the Hellman Family Faculty Fund as one of the best of Berkeley researchers. And in 2012, he won the Robert O. Collins Award in African Studies, as well as the American Cultures Innovation in Teaching Award. In 2014, he, was, he earned the Hendricks Award of the New Netherland Institute for his research on the early Dutch history of New York and the first community of enslaved Africans in Manhattan. In 2015, his article, From Moors to Indians, The Mardi Gras Indians and the Three Transformations of St. James, won the Louisiana Historical Association's President's Memorial Award for the best article published that year in the association's journal. As managing editor of that journal, I first met Jerome while working on that article. I recognized the value of his work, and I recruited him as the author uh, of a book for the University of Louisiana at Lafayette Press, for which I also served as director. The UL Press published his book, From the Kingdom of Congo to Congo Square, Congo Dances and the Origins of the Mardi Gras Indians in 2017 to wide acclaim. The book received the Gold Medal Independent Publishers Book Award, and re reviewers called it, quote, a major work and a very intricate study that challenges the ways we should think about the interactions between European and African societies. Professor Jerome DeWolf. Well, welcome to all of you. My name is Jerome DeWolf. I'm a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. And it is my pleasure to present to you today my recent book on the history of the Mardi Gras Indians. We're speaking here about one of America's most iconic African-American performance traditions. It's a tradition that takes us to the wonderful city of New Orleans, a city with a different history than most other American cities, a city with a French and a Spanish colonial history, a city with a predominantly Catholic history, a city that celebrates Carnival or Mardi Gras, a city also with a large African-American population that had a tremendous influence on the development of popular music in America. It is also a city famous for its Mardi Gras Indians. Mardi Gras Indians being a group, or as they call themselves, a gang or a tribe, of black people who celebrate Mardi Gras in a very interesting way. And they do so by dressing up with an abundance of feathers, which makes them look to outsiders as Indians, hence the name Mardi Gras Indians, which by the way, is a name given to them by outsiders. They parade through town in an almost militaristic way. They have a leader, called the Big Chief. And here on the screen, you can see an example of such a Big Chief. They typically also have a flag boy who carries the banner of the gang. There's also a character known as the Wild Man, whose task it is to keep the audience away from the performers. Um, there is also typically a spy boy who, who, who function as a type of scout. And the group is accompanied by uh, friends, supporters who sing and play instruments, and they are known as the second line. Now, this custom raises several questions, two of which I will discuss here today with you. First of all, why do Black people dress up like Indians in the first place? And secondly, what is the origin of the tradition? There exist several theories on this, and all these theories have been contested to the point that a famous Mardi Gras Indian big chief 
once said, nobody ain't never gonna find the code, right? Nobody will ever be able to understand the secrets that we have with regard to the origin and the meaning of this performance. And I myself, I don't have the arrogance to say that I have an answer to all questions. And I certainly don't have the arrogance to explain what the tradition means to the black community in New Orleans today. But I do believe that I have something interesting to say about the origins of the tradition. It's a new theory, a theory that grew out of a previous book I published, a book dealing with an African-American performance tradition in the city of New York, or the state of New York rather, a tradition known as, as Pinkster, a tradition that, that disappeared in the 19th century but in the context of which I found interesting parallels with the Mardi Gras Indians. And I also discovered a very interesting source in a 19th century New York newspaper about performances by members of the black community in New Orleans. A source that luckily I kept. And once I finished my book on Pinkster in New York, I went back to that source and discovered I had actually found a little piece of gold that allowed me to provide kind of a new perspective on the, on the history of the Mardi Gras Indians, which then led to the book that I'm presenting to you today. Now, let us focus here a little bit more in detail on the question of the origin of the tradition. And um, some scholars have claimed that the Mardi Gras Indians are a late 19th century tradition whose founding father is a man called Bicat Baptiste, who allegedly formed the very first Mardi Gras Indian gang, which he called the Creole Wild West. And allegedly, Mr. Baptiste was of mixed African Native American descent. So according to this theory, the Mardi Gras Indians are essentially a tradition that honors two traditionally oppressed peoples. Um, namely African Americans and Native Americans. It was a theory that developed during the era of the civil rights movement. And, and that should not be a surprise because this theory of course corresponds clearly to the norms and values of the civil rights movement. And it had an important positive consequence because it, it, it contributed to a change in reputation of the Mardi Gras Indians which used to be a performance that was associated with poverty, with violence, with heavy drinking, to the point that even black middle-class families would shy away from these Mardi Gras Indians. And thanks to this new interpretation, the reputation of the tradition changed completely. It came to be seen as a tradition that people can be proud of. Yeah, to the point that the city of New Orleans even started to, to make publicity with this, this tradition. There is, however, there is a problem. And the problem is that there is no convincing evidence of traces of local Native American groups on the um, development of the Mardi Gras Indians. If you look at the way um, Indians are being depicted, uh, on the costumes of the Mardi Gras Indians, what you see are essentially stereotypical reproductions of Native Americans, right? Um, these are essentially images of, of Plains Indians who used to live thousands of miles away from Louisiana, which, which makes it questionable that this tradition actually grew out of a merger of, of Louisiana, Native American and um, African American traditions. And, and these stereotypical depictions of Plains Indians actually leads to a second theory on the origin of the tradition, which is much less heroic. Because um, some scholars have claimed that the Mardi Gras Indians are essentially copies of the 19th century shows that used to be organized by Buffalo Bill, the so-called Wild West shows. Yeah. And people were so impressed by these shows that they ended up imitating characters from these Wild West shows. And there's certainly 
must have been some influence from these shows. It is not by, by accident, for instance, that Mr. Batiste called his gang the Creole Wild West, right? So you see in the name kind of a correspondence to these shows by, by Buffalo Bill. But then another question comes up, right? Um, why, why did this tradition become so important to the African-American community? If it was just imitating Buffalo Bill, why, why did it acquire this emotional importance to, to the community? It, and, and my conviction, therefore, is that what happened here is the following. What happened is that Mr. Batiste, when he founded his Creole Wild West gang, he actually built on an earlier tradition that in other words, already before Buffalo Bill arrived in Louisiana with his Wild West show, there were already at that time African-Americans who used to have a performance that included participants who were dressed in an abundance of feathers. And I'm, and I'm not the first scholar to make that claim. Other scholars have also argued that um, the tradition of, of the Mardi Gras Indians is actually very old and predates the arrival of Buffalo Bill Wild West shows. And as an example, I could quote Samuel Kinzer, yeah, who, who wrote the Mardi Gras Indian tradition was long in gestation, or Reed Mitchell, the Mardi Gras Indian traditions must have cultivated within the Black community long before. And an additional reason to make this claim is that Black people dressing up with feathers, which makes them to outsiders look like Indians, is not unique to New Orleans. You see that in other parts of the Americas. For instance, you see it in the case of, of Cuba, where we have pictures. Here you see an example of groups of Black performers, including somebody carrying a banner, including musicians, um, and including men who are dressed with an abundance of feathers. We have sources such as here, the quotation below from a French visitor who in 1856 went to Cuba. He saw a performance by black people. And then he argued some blacks had transformed themselves into South American savages, redskins or Apaches. Yeah? So they were dressed with such an abundance of feathers that he compared them to Apaches. Yeah? And that shows, in fact, that New Orleans is not unique in the sense that it has a tradition whereby Black people dress up with an abundance of feathers, which to outsiders makes them look like Indians. And mind you, this is a quotation from 1856, at a time when Buffalo Bill was still a little boy. So what is my theory? My theory is that the Mardi Gras Indians started as a variant of a much broader tradition in the Americas, whereby black people would dress up with feathers, which to outsiders made them look like Indians. And this was a feature that in the case of New Orleans was later reinforced and stereotyped with the arrival of Buffalo Bill and his Wild West shows. Now, how did I come to this conclusion? Well, like many others before me, I started my research on Congo Square. Congo Square being an iconic place in the city of New Orleans, where enslaved Africans used to gather on Sundays to dance. And it's not by accident that it was called Congo Square, because the majority of the enslaved Africans in New Orleans at the time um, had roots in the Congo region of Africa. And since those with roots in the Congo formed the largest and most influential group, they had a tremendous influence on local dance, music, and performance culture. Again, I'm not the first scholar to make this claim. I could mention, for instance, a colleague, Ned Suplet, who wrote a wonderful book on performance traditions in, in New Orleans, who stressed in his book the legacy of the Congo yeah, and the influence uh, the Congo region had on uh, the development of popular music in New Orleans and in America uh, in general. Um, what do we know 
what do we know about members of, of the Congo community in New Orleans and the way they would dance? Well, we have a very interesting source, a source from the year 1823 from a missionary, a missionary who um, visited New Orleans and who reported um, that he went to Congo Square. He then saw the Congo dances on Congo Square and he makes a few interesting observations in his diary. He mentions, for instance, that on Congo Square, one could see um, a Congo dance that was led by a Congo king. The dances were kind of agitated dances, acrobatic dances. Um, interesting also is that he reports that the dancers would use little belts and that one would hear, they would tinkle when they would dance. And very interesting also is the last sentence here when he says, I have seen groups of these moody and silent sons of the forest at these, at these celebrations, which essentially is a reference to Native Americans. Yeah? So apparently already in, 18, uh, in, in the 1820s, yeah, there were people that reminded him as an outsider of Native Americans, either because they were Native Americans or they were dressed like Native Americans. And mind you again, uh, all of this was written down even before Buffalo Bill was actually born. Yeah? So another indication that there must have been something already there long before Buffalo Bill arrived in New Orleans. If you go to Congo Square in New Orleans today, you will see there a sign. You will see this um, sign over there. The sign that says, this is where the Mardi Gras Indians were born. And I think that is correct. I think the, the Mardi Gras Indians were in fact born on Congo Square. And you do find quite a number of parallels between um, this quote by Timothy Flint and, and the way the Mardi Gras Indians perform today. But, but one element is missing. And that element is the feathers. Yeah? Timothy Flint doesn't mention uh, the feathers. He mentions that some dancers reminded him of, of Indians, but he doesn't explicitly mention that they would dress up with feathers. And this makes the quote that I discovered in my 19th century New York newspaper valuable because it's the very first proof, so to speak, that we have that indeed already in the 19th century, African-Americans in New Orleans would have performances whereby some of the performance, performers would dress up with an abundance of feathers. So let me share this quote with you. Here it is from the Sunday Times in New York, 1849. Somebody from that newspaper travels to New Orleans, goes to Congo Square, he sees a king of Congo, he says. And then it has a lot of performances. One of them wears enormous horns. Another one has so many feathers that it reminds him of a chanticleer. And another one, he, he, he says, he, he is spreading behind him the plumes of the peacock. And once again, he also mentions that they had lots of little, little bells attached to their clothing that would jingle and chime as they move. Yeah. And here we find two characteristics that allows us to make a connection to the Mardi Gras Indians. First of all, the feathers, right? So many feathers that they look like a chanticleer to him, that, that they have feathers of the peacock. Um, um, and, 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 and also uh, this very interesting reference to a man with enormous horns, which clearly, which clearly reminds us of a character that today in the Mardi Gras Indians is called the wild man who has these characteristic horns and the abundance of, of feathers. Yeah. Now, I've been speaking quite a lot so far about Congo dances, Congo king, but, but what do I actually mean by Congo? Yeah. If we speak about Congo in the context of the transatlantic slavery, we do, not mention, we do not mean the same as what Congo is today. We're actually speaking about, about an older Congo, an ancient kingdom in Africa that used to be called Congo and had a territory that um, you can see here on this map. It was located actually mostly in, in, in the northwestern part 
of what today is called Angola. That's where the, the ancient Congo kingdom was located. And this is where many um, of the um, black people in New Orleans had their roots. Yeah? Because thousands of people from this Congo kingdom were shipped to the Americas, including uh, New Orleans. Um, so what I did next was I uh, looked for information about performances in this ancient Congo kingdom. And I was able um, to find um, some very interesting information about typical performances in the Congo kingdom. The most famous performance of the Congo kingdom was known as the Sangha. The Sangha was a type of mock war performance whereby dancers would show skills that were important for African warfare. They would typically bend, spin, jump. These were very acrobatic dances, yeah? Because the dances were in a way a mock war performance. Yeah? And here is a description of these Sangha dances from the Congo kingdom. Yeah, they were feasts during which the Congolese would imitate battles. You find already in the 15th century in, in a Portuguese document, not by accident, a Portuguese one, because the Portuguese were the first Europeans to interact with people in this Congo kingdom. Um, I have more detailed uh, descriptions of these sanghas. Let me share one with you. And I also have a depiction, which is interesting for us. First of all, the quote, right? It mentions the sanghas, and it mentioned that it would be a king of Congo. This was kind of a, of a mock war dance. It would involve soldiers. And very important for us is the last sentence here. It says, on their heads, they attached lots of feathers of different colors, yeah? which was something typical for soldiers, for warriors to do in this, in this mock war dance where they would perform with swords or with bows and arrows. And you can see a depiction here below of a group of Congolese. And you see these two men sitting here. These are two warriors. And if you look at their hats, you see indeed that on their hats, they have an abundance of feathers, which apparently was typical for Congolese warriors when they would perform this Sangha dance. I have a second quote that is even more interesting. Here he is, yeah? again about the Sanghas. And it mentions that Congolese warriors would typically wear a cap with uh, ostrich or peacock and other feathers. And they would also, says the quote, very interesting, use a belt with tiny little bells attached to it, yeah? which of course reminds us of what we saw earlier in New Orleans, right? The use of an abundance of feathers and the use of tiny little bells. Yeah? And we have even a description, a, a depiction here below. We see such a, such a dancer of a Sangha performance. Yeah? We see the bow and arrow, we see all the feathers and we see the tiny little bells. Yeah? And, and I think you will agree with me if I say, let me take this, this person here yeah, in the middle and let me show a random person in the streets of New Orleans and ask that person, what do you see? Very likely is that many people will say, oh, I see an Indian, right? Because we see a bow and arrow, we see a lot of feathers and we kind of associate this immediately with Native Americans. And we forget that this was actually a typically African tradition, a typically African performance from the Congo region. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, um, what is the next question? The next question is, do we have any information, any proof that these Sangha performances from the Congo kingdom traveled to the Americas? Is there proof? The answer is yes. I was able to find evidence that indeed enslaved Africans from the Congo region brought with them this Sangha performance tradition to the Americas. And I found evidence of this in a country called Suriname. Some of you may not be familiar with Suriname. It's a small country in South America, a neighboring country to Brazil, a country um, with uh, a large um, uh, population with roots in Africa. 
um, some of which managed to escape while they were still uh, enslaved. They managed to escape to the jungle. They would establish in, in the Surinamese jungle their own free communities, and they would kind of continue to live just the way as they had been living in Africa, um, in those communities um, in, in the Surinamese jungle. Um, in the 19th century, one of them will convert to Christianity. He will learn to write and to read, and he will start to write his own biography. And he will write in his biography about all kinds of traditions that the members of his community used to honor. And then he writes about kind of a, a typical dance performance that they would have in his community. And what does he say? The dance performance, he says, was called a sangha. Yeah? And then he, he, he explains what is a sangha. He says, well, a sangha, that means that a lot of people with weapons, they run around and they act just like warriors used to fight in Africa. Yeah? So you clearly see here evidence, right? That this Congolese sangha performance was brought to the Americas by people who had been enslaved, right? They were taken to the Americas, but they brought with them these, this Sangha performance tradition. And since we now have evidence that it existed in Suriname, I became very interested in a neighboring country of Suriname, namely Brazil. Why Brazil? Well, first of all, because um, no other country in the world received more enslaved Africans than Brazil, about 40%. Of, of the enslaved Africans were sent to Brazil. And secondly, the vast majority of the enslaved Africans who arrived in Brazil originated from the Congo region. Yeah. So if we have traces in Suriname of the Sangha performance, very likely we, need, we will find something in Brazil that also kinds of relates to this performance tradition. So then the next thing I did was I studied performance traditions in Brazil. And what was I able to discover? Well, I was able to discover that enslaved Africans in Brazil with roots in the Congo region, they used to elect their own king. They would call this king the, the Congo king, just like in New Orleans. And they would honor this king with performances, with parades. Um, here you have a 19th century depiction of such a parade of, of, of the, the um, Congo community in Brazil. And if you look carefully, um, you see uh, here uh, musicians in front, you see the banners of the organization, and you also see here in the middle with his crown, the Congo King. Yeah? And what were these organizations? Well, these organizations developed in the context of so-called confraternities or brotherhoods. Uh, for those of you who have a Catholic background, uh, you may be familiar with the term confraternity. It's essentially a mutual aid and burial organization that uh, has members who pay dues and then get together on specific days uh, for prayers. Um, they typically have a patron saint. Um, and if you're a member of a confraternity, you are guaranteed a, 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 a decent burial that is organized with a procession by the members of your confraternity. And what happened in the case of Brazil and in other parts of Latin America is that enslaved people were allowed um, to have their own confraternities. And these organizations gave the enslaved some leeway to organize themselves in accordance with their own cultural traditions. It allowed, for instance, the members of the Congo community to elect their own kings in these confraternities, and then to parade and celebrate these kings on specific holidays with parades. And during those parades, the kings were, 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 were parading with big bands and banners, but also with their own guards, with their own soldiers. Yeah? And how did these soldiers look like? Well, very interestingly, I found a description from the 19th century. Uh, a British visitor comes to Brazil. He sees such a parade with the Congo king and dancers. 
And, and then he, he makes the following observation. He says, well, um, these people, he says, they were, they were, they were dressed after this, this, the style of the Mani Congo, the lords of the Congo land. And very interestingly, he writes, some of the members I saw in this parade, they had plumed headgear. So they had lots of feathers on, on their head, which reminded him of the red man. In other words, it reminded him of Native Americans, of Indians. Yeah. Um, interestingly, um, this tradition still survives in some parts of rural Brazil. Uh, in rural Brazil, you still find descendants of formerly enslaved people who still have their old confraternities. In the context of these confraternities, they still today elect their kings and they still honor these kings with parades, whereby the king would, would march through town with music bands and, 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 and the banner of, of the confraternity, and the king would be protected by an army of soldiers. And, and let me share with you a picture of these soldiers. And when you look at the picture of these soldiers, you immediately see the resemblance to the images I showed to you earlier from the Congo Kingdom. Because in fact, these soldiers of the Congo King are um, clearly wearing an abundance of feathers on their heads. They also have tassels, which is another um, feature that shows up in, in, in other references. Uh, but, but very clearly, you see here the abundance of feathers. Yeah. And this abundance of feathers, which, which reminds outsiders of, of, of Indians, yeah, was quite puzzling to anthropologists in Brazil, yeah, who wonder, you know, you have these, these kings, and here you see the king, by the way, sitting on the left, and then these are the soldiers of the king, but why do they have so many feathers? Yeah? Let me share with you um, a, a reference by a very famous Brazilian anthropologist who say it's so curious, he says, in Brazil, you have these performances of the Congo community. They have their own king, but then they have these warriors and they wear so many feathers, they look like Indians. He says, it's, it's very curious, he says, that the Indian element converged into the Congo dances. What is my opinion? My opinion is that he's wrong, that these are not Indian elements. That, that these, uh, this abundance of feathers is not an Indian tradition, it is actually a Congolese tradition, because these are people who are um, representing Congolese warriors. Yeah. Now, not just in Brazil, but in many places, in, uh, in many places in Latin America, you find references to such Congo dances, Congo parades, and they all share certain characteristics. First of all, they all show up in places with a strong historical presence of enslaved Africans from the Congo region. Secondly, they all feature some type of, of performance that has kind of a military characteristic. Um, it, it looks a bit like a mock war parade, a mock war dance. Thirdly, uh, they all have kings, Congo kings. Um, number four, they all do so in the context of confraternities or mutual aid organizations. And last but not least, they all include men who, who are dressed up with an abundance of feathers. Yeah. Um, and here is some proof. A colleague of mine, Judith Vettelheim, did a lot of research on, on Black folklore all over the Americas. And, and then she, she comes to one conclusion with regard to performances of people with roots in the Congo region. She says the following, she says, it's so curious, he says, that one of the main identifying signs of Congo performances in the Americas is precisely the feathered headdress. Yeah? And this is important, I think, because it, it clearly allows a connection to this very important performance tradition from the Congo region in Africa, namely this Sangha war dance. Yeah? So let us then at this point go back to New Orleans and let us go back to the Mardi Gras Indians. What is my theory? 
my theory is that in order for us to understand the roots of the Mardi Gras Indians, we need to go back in history. And we need to go back to the very early Spanish history of New Orleans at a time that there was a very close connection between New Orleans and Cuba. Yeah. And there, I think, we find um, the, the roots of this tradition um, uh, whereby black people would have performances whereby they would, they would um, have an abundance of feathers. Um, what is my evidence? Well, my evidence is an archival document dating back to the Spanish era in New Orleans, a time when there was a close connection between um, Louisiana and Cuba, and where in the year 1786, 1786, a festive tradition of the black population in New Orleans was prohibited. It was prohibited by the authorities who, who found that this was, it was too disturbing. And, and how did the Spanish authorities in New Orleans refer to this tradition? They said, we decided to prohibit, and I will say it in Spanish, and then I will translate it into English for you. They said, we decided, 1786, we decided to prohibit the los tangos or bailes de negros. In other words, we prohibit the tangos or the dances of the black people. Now, what are tangos? Many of you may be familiar with the Argentinian partner dance called tango, but that's not where the word tango originated. The word tango is actually of African origin. It relates to performances of, of, um, of um, um, people with roots in Africa. It was actually the Cuban name of a performance of, of, of um, enslaved Africans in Cuba. And it was typical for the members of the Congo community. Whenever they had performances in their confraternities, which are kings and, and, and their warriors and, and, and their banners, yeah, those performances in Cuba used to be called tangos. And here is proof, proof from Cuba. Yeah? The term tango, what does it mean? Well, it means it's a large crowd of marching people through the streets, playing music, singing, typically associated with parades of the largest confraternity, namely the one with the members of the Congo community. And then very important for us, uh, a quotation from the mid 19th century from Cuba, where somebody again speaks about these tangos, right? These parades of the confraternity with the members of the Congo nation. And what does the person stress? He stresses in his description, in these tangos, he said, some dress up like Indians with feathers and with belts. Yeah? And here you see once again, this, 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 this tendency whereby an outsider sees these black people performing, performing, they have lots of feathers. It makes him look like Indians yeah? because the feathers he associates it with Indians. And he also mentions interestingly, the bells. Yeah? So we see here a very interesting and fascinating connection to New Orleans, where these performances also existed, yeah? but eventually were prohibited. But in spite of this prohibition, the African American community in New Orleans continued this performance. Yeah? So to conclude, what is my theory? What are the roots of the Mardi Gras? Indians? Well, my theory is, that the roots are a mock war performance from the Congo region in Africa that was brought to the Americas in the context of the transatlantic slave trade. It survived in Iberian colonies, including Louisiana, within the structure of confraternities where the enslaved had some leeway to hold on to certain African tradition. And this was possible in the case of New Orleans for a number of reasons. First of all, the Spanish history. Second, a large number of enslaved people with roots in the Congo region in Africa. Third, New Orleans was a Catholic city, a city with a tradition of street performance, processions, parade, carnival. Number four, it's a city where people used to take pride in a decent funeral 
Hence the popularity of confraternities that would organize processions when somebody was, was buried. So the importance of confraternities. And then and number five, um, of course, the specific history of the black community in New Orleans, a history of discrimination, yeah? um, a history of discrimination that as a result of which <clears throat> the concept of mutual aid becomes very important to this community. Because if you are a community that is being discriminated, that is being segregated, the only ones, the only ones you could rely on for help were your own brothers and sisters. And this is what made mutual aid societies so appealing to African Americans in New Orleans. Yeah. In fact, uh, research on the Mardi Gras Indians <clears throat> by a man called David Draper in the 1970s revealed that these groups do much more than just dancing and playing music. And that to this day, the Mardi Gras Indian gangs function also as mutual aid associations. Yeah? And that's a very important insight. Yeah? Outsiders only tend to see the music and the dance. Yeah? But, but Mr. Draper, he actually was a student at a time, a PhD student, and he wrote a wonderful study on the Mardi Gras Indians and, and stressed right, that the Mardi Gras Indian gangs, they provide also financial aid to those in trouble. Yeah? They provide solidarity. Yeah? Um, and he even mentions to adult members, the social entertainment is of secondary importance in comparison of being member of the Mutual Aid Association. Last but not least, I think we need to stress also the fact that people with roots in Congo, they took pride in their African roots, in their African tradition. And they proved to be very skillful to adjust themselves and their tradition to changing societies, to changing times. And I will end my presentation with a quote from my own book, where I stress this importance of, of, of changing and adaptability. Yeah? And the quote I selected for you is, as we have seen in the history of the Mardi Gras Indians, yeah? the, the, the Congolese were masters of adaptability and improvisation or to say it with the New Orleans touch, their power lay in jazz, not just as a style of music, but as a way of life. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. I thank you for your attention and I say goodbye. <laughs>